This episode, I want to try something new. We see statistics that show how many people listen to this podcast, but it doesn't show us who our listeners are. I'm curious about who listens to this podcast, and I think some of you might be interested in what kind of community of listeners you're a part of. If you'd like to share a little bit about where you are on your journey, how you found this podcast, and what you are looking for, you can click a link in the show notes, and I'll read your submission on the podcast. No need to share any identifying information, and the information you do share will not be used for any other purpose. Thanks. Welcome to the Jungian Anthology Podcast by the C.G. Jung Institute of Chicago. Why a Conscious Life Has a Positive End, an interview with Dan Ross. In this episode, Patricia Martin interviews Jungian analyst Dan Ross about conscious individuation throughout life stages and why it makes for a better death. Daniel Ross, RN, PMHNP, MSN, MBA, has been a nurse for 40 years. He has worked extensively as director of clinical services in the field of home health care and hospice. As a psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner, he brings both a medical and psychiatric experience to his work. He currently works part-time in the field of palliative care and hospice as a nurse practitioner, visiting patients in their home or nursing facility, helping them in their transition to hospice. He is also a Jungian analyst in private practice in downtown Chicago. Patricia Martin is a noted cultural analyst, author, and consultant, and a producer on this podcast. For a more complete file, just check the show notes. You can support this podcast by making a donation to the C.G. Young Institute of Chicago, purchasing something in our online store, coming to any of our online programs, our training programs, or just submitting a review on iTunes. Reviews help people find this podcast and help us find new listeners. Thanks. And now here's the interview. Welcome to Jungian Anthology. This is Patricia Martin. I'm a researcher, author, and professional affiliate of the C.G. Jung Institute Chicago. Today, I'm going to be talking with Dan Ross. Dan is a Jungian analyst who co-teaches a six-month course that is an immersion into Carl Jung's biography, Memories, Dreams, and Reflections at the C.G. Jung Institute Chicago. Dan has been a nurse working in hospice for over 30 years. As a psychiatric mental health practitioner, he brings both a medical and psychiatric experience to the field of -of end-of-life care. Dan also maintains a private practice in the Chicago area. Dan, welcome. Thank you, Patricia. So as I was looking over the many topics that you cover in your course about Jung's life and his ideas, there were so many important themes that jumped out. But I think the one that really stood out to me for today's conversation was Jung's journey into the realm of the unconscious. Mm. And I know that there was, you know, when he was a young pioneer, um, sort of a mentee of, of Sigmund Freud's, they had a famous disagreement about the idea of the unconscious. Can you explain why that was such a deal breaker for the two of them and why it kind of forced a schism? Yeah, I think uh, to, to um, try to put it simply, and it's much more complicated than this, but uh, Jung, Freud, saw the unconscious as a consequence of the ego that what was unacceptable or um, impossible for the ego to uh, grasp or hold on to or tolerate uh, 
gets cast into the unconscious, usually uh, around um, uh, sexual wishes that there are um, that are that cause a conflict within the individual, uh, uh, an immense conflict. And Jung, although he celebrated uh, Freud's um, discoveries of the unconscious, from very early on, uh, Jung saw, and and it took him a while to to be able to grasp or articulate this, but that the un that the ego actually comes from the unconscious. And the unconscious was there long, long before the ego. Uh, and the unconscious as collective uh, is, is kind of a, uh, a history of mankind and all that mankind has experienced. And that, that was simply very difficult for Freud to accept um, and impossible, you know, for its notorious rigidity around his, uh, his theories and his practice of psychoanalysis. Um, and, and Jung was very open and to, the, to what he was experiencing empirically, what, what he was experiencing in his practice, very open to uh, all kinds of things, um, inc including occultism, which he had a relationship to from early childhood. And Freud was absolutely against occultism and, and told Jung that. Uh, at one point he told Jung um, that we have to, whatever you do, hold on to the, to the sexual theory um, uh, so that we can, uh, because it's, it's a bulwark. And Jung asked him, a bulwark against what? And Freud said, uh, a bulwark against the, the black tide of occultism or something like that. I'm not sure I'm quoting that exactly, but uh, and Jung knew right then and there um, that he ultimately would not be able to uh, stay with Freud's uh, more rigid approach to the unconscious. And so, it, that manifested in the psychology of the unconscious uh, when it was published in 1913. And that was too much for Freud. It was over at that point. I see. I see. So why is the unconscious so critical to understanding ourselves? Um, um, well, that's a good question because it is so much, it is so much of ourselves. It is such, so much more of ourselves than we, uh, than we grasp when we're, when we're young. Uh, when we're young, we think that, uh, that, that ego is everything, uh, that what we think, uh, how we deliberate, how we make decisions, that's all coming from uh, when we're young, we think it's coming from, well, the only place it could come from. But if we allow ourselves to be, to see, to, to re what we use the term relativize the ego in terms of something bigger than us, um, then we see that our life has been informed by something that we were not aware of and, and, and get glimpses of over time. And if we study it, um, that as Jung did, um, we can develop a whole different relationship to everything that is not I, not us. Uh, Jung had this dream um, I forget how old he was, but it was, it was, he was still young, I think in his teens, um, late teens. And the dream, I think, really put him on a particular path. And it was a dream in which he was um, uh, surrounded by darkness and he was carrying a small light. Um, and he realized, and that, that he, he um, sensed that something very large was coming up behind him, something large and black. Um, and he realized that this small light he was holding was all he had of consciousness, all, all of what he knew. Um, and that what was much bigger in contrast to that, what was, what was following him and that he called the shadow. 
uh, and that the shadow actually carried um, his number two personality. So he started, you know, this idea of number one, number two personality that he, he grew up with in, in childhood and, and was able to discern. He was now developing some uh, conceptualization around and he attributed all of this dark, this black thing uh, as shadow and this little light as, as consciousness. And that he, that this was something he was going to be in relationship to the rest of his life. So uh, this is a beautiful image that, mm. that you can derive from this dream is that this little light is surrounded by a much larger mass. Yes. And that yes. much larger mass really kind of, it contains, that's the container for all that is unconscious to Everything. us, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So the, the dream thing is is important important in so many ways, I think, right? This is another big realm for uh, Jungian analysis is dream work. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, because I'm a writer, I keep a daily journal. Mm -hmm. And you writers believe that, you know, if you write every day, it sort of opens you, it opens the channel to connect to your creativity. Sure. Uh, it doesn't matter what you write about, as long as you're just writing every day. And I, I wondered if... Jungians keep a daily journal of their dreams. Mm. And if they do, what, 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 what comes of that? You know, mm. what, what, what do your patients or your, your analysands tend to derive if they keep a daily dream journal? Mm. And not all do, but those that do, I, I think it's a sign very often that they've made a switch. Uh, they've made a switch from a more psychotherapeutic relationship to a more analytic relationship. Because, because when you're keeping a journal, you're having uh, a relationship with and a conversation with, dialogue with uh, yourself or some aspect of yourself. Um, and you're realizing often that there are different parts of you and uh, the dreams reflect um, these different parts of you uh, and or can reflect these different parts of you. And that um, having a relationship to the unconscious and, and these different personalities perhaps within us uh, is, and, and treating them as such uh, really can change how your attitude towards the unconscious and how, how you get along in life from day to day. Um, it's, a, it's a remarkable thing. Um, and not all my uh, patients reach or move to that stage. Uh, some of them um, reach a, a state in which their, their symptoms may have subsided or, or mitigated and that may be enough for them. Or they may come back later, back into therapy with a different attitude, um, having matured after that. Um, but, but there is something about journaling that I notice uh, with, with some of my patients that if they've reached a stage, uh -huh. a different stage. Yeah. So it's a, it, you could say that it's sort of a marker of their individuation, which is another mm -hmm. big idea mm -hmm. of, of Carl Jung's is yes. this idea of how we grow into being a more whole and integrated person, right. meaning that we have accessed our unconscious and we're sort of knitting this all together. Yes, um, absolutely. Is I that like how that you image. Would, yeah. Is that how you would define individuation? I mean, how do you talk about it? Boy, individuation is such a big thing. Um, the weaving together of uh, parts of ourselves uh, is an image. Uh, this idea of, in mythology, of dismemberment, uh, that one goes through a process of dismemberment and has to remember uh, uh, aspects of ourselves. Uh, we can't seem to escape childhood without having cast off 
uh, important parts of our personality simply because they were not acceptable uh, to the to our parents or the the uh, the, uh, the the people that we grew up with or the or the culture or the or society and so um, adulthood is uh, is best um, involves this re this recollecting uh, of ourselves. I think, um, but there's so many different ways of looking at individuation too, because in my work uh, with death and dying, I've discovered that uh, all our life is a movement towards really embracing and owning and feeling our own mortality, our own limit, limitedness. Um, and that's a very, very important part of individuation. It's a, it's a matter of becoming more embodied uh, and more present. Um, and I noticed working with people at the end of life, a difference between those that had done that, that work um, or, or had, had moved through life in a more embodied way, uh, that the end of their life is, is not as um, difficult, is not as violent, is not as uh, disturbed. Uh, and there, I, I noticed over the years working in hospice, that there's a contrast between between how people end their lives, um, and that I think has a great deal to do with how they've lived their life. Say more about this idea of how one faces the end of life if one has done the work of consciously building a relationship with their unconscious or consciously individuating, which means you know you're. You're, you're seeking experiences and you're seeking um, an inner sense of yourself yeah. versus someone who hasn't done that work. Yeah. Can you be more specific? Yeah, I think um, I, I, I can tell if I meet somebody that's lived a very egocentric life and very driven life um, and uh, tyrannical in a sense, meaning that they've been led by some inner tyrant that has pushed them and pushed them and pushed them, um, that uh, often the end of life becomes very difficult because, because they haven't reconciled anything of their past because they were always looking towards the future. Part of individuation is reconciling your past or, or, or coming to terms with your past, um, uh, your regrets, uh, the paths you didn't take in life, uh, and, and mourning the missed opportunities in your life. Mourning becomes very important late in life. Um, and if you've avoided that, uh, that mourning comes back uh, it, with, with a vengeance, it seems. And that, that manifests often with very very uh, severe symptoms in, in some people. And I'm talking about a, 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 a fraction of, of the people that I've, I've worked with, not, not a large number. For the most part, I find that people are, are, are approach their end of their life quite, quite prepared. That's interesting. I yeah. wondered about that because, you know, when you were talking about the interest that Jung cultivated his entire career uh, in occultism and yeah. other ways, astrology and the tarot and other ways to kind of trigger uh, material that yeah. might arise from his unconscious. He also became a darling, his theories became a darling of the new age. And I think the yeah. new age was actually a phrase he coined. Yes. And so I wonder as boomers immerse themselves in the in the new age yeah. and really sort of embraced it and you know true jungians believe that this was a, a sort of misuse yeah. of of jungian theory but be that as it may there were there was an entire generation that is now coming of age and 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 facing the end of life yeah and i wonder how that new age mysticism has prepared people or not prepared people to face the end of life? That's a good question. I, th I think um, the end of life 
uh, for me, the way I describe it now is um, uh, opens up liminal space. Um, and how one has dealt with liminal uh, psychological space through their life, I think um, has, has um, informs how they do so at the end of life. I mean, once we're told there's nothing more that can be done, uh, often patients refer to hospice or, uh, or palliative care. Uh, there's this being this idea that, that the, the person is now cast into this, you know, the space, this, okay, the, the medical model is no longer, is no, no longer able to keep me alive. Uh, there's nothing more they can do. And I'm on my own. There's a sense of now I'm on my own. Now, for some, it's a terrifying experience. Uh, I often meet with people when first refer, referred to palliative care, um, very, very anxious um, about this new, this new position that they're in, um, in their life. And um, a lot of it has to do with developing a relationship uh, of trust and then understanding what's emerging at this time. And I've just uh, experienced all kinds of amazing things that once um, the heroic attitude, what I call the heroic attitude, which is the attitude of, I'm going to do everything, you know, to stay alive. Uh, once that shifts, um, then it opens up the consciousness to, to, to uh, finishing, what I call finishing one's life. And that may include rituals of some kind that may include giving things away that might include uh, forming your, uh, uh, your uh, memorial service. Uh, it may include uh, having uh, last conversations with people. It's, it opens up people to, um, to finishing their relationship to life uh, and, I, and, I, and in my experience, that is very rewarding to people and, and to the family members, to people around them, to clinicians that work with them. And it's a, it's a wonderful thing to see. But I think it comes from the fact that this sta that stage, even if culturally we don't identify it as such, is, is a sp sacred space that provides for growth and opportunity that may have not been available prior to this, this stage of life. Well, as I think about that, I also wonder about this idea of loss that family members feel. Yeah. And I know you counsel families yes. as well as, you know, the person who's facing the end of life. Yes. And um, people often talk about the pain of that. And mm. I, you know, Jung has a quote in his, uh, in his biography where he says, there is no coming to consciousness without pain. Mm. And that, that pain and loss are, are part of what helps us individuate. So, I mean, that's not exactly a selling point, pain. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in our culture, yeah. we want to be pain-free. We pay to have that done, right? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so is becoming more conscious necessarily painful? I think so, but the pain is, uh, the, the, the pain, um, is, the, the pain just it seems to be, go along with uh, movement, psychological movement, because we're uh, moving out of old, structures that we depended on and are familiar with into new structures that we're not familiar with. And that's scary and painful because we have to give up parts of ourselves. Um, I, I think describing the pain is, is hard. Oh, in my experience with working with people, um, there's the resistance to movement to the movement, I think, is a measure of, of, of fear that once they confront it or once they experience it or once they mourn the loss of that which they, they are losing, 
it was not as bad as they anticipated. It, in other words, they, 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 they survive it. Mm -hmm. And in my experience, most, most people do and can, um, but they need, um, I guess they need the, the hope that they can, and they need to eventually own that hope. Whereas the, the clinician generally holds it for, for a time being until the patient can, can hold it. Oh, so um, this idea of hope, I mean, I also wonder if because Young sort of rejected formal religion, and that was a big deal in his life because of his family mm. um, and their ties to formal religion. Uh, but he embraced an, an option, you know, he embraced a sense of the soul as being a part of the psyche, of being uh, accessible through ritual and access to the unconscious, I wonder if, if you could talk about Jung and how he is hopeful. Like, where mm. do you find moments of true hope in what Carl Jung writes about and thought about? It's a good question. First of all, I, I would clarify, I, I think... Jung was very religious um, and I think religion became extremely important to him because as you said, because of his background, uh, but it became important to him to um, not simply believe. Uh, there's a BBC interview that the interviewer asked him if, if he believed in God and he really stopped and paused and said quite honestly that he struggled with that word belief. Um, and then he said, I know. And I think uh, Jung struggled with his father who struggled with his belief, was in conflict because of the belief and the teachings of uh, the Methodist uh, church and the dogma that he was caught up in Jung, um, Jung uh, experienced his father's st struggle with that. And part of his work was to arrive at a place where he knew uh, that the unconscious had, um, first of all, we have, we have a religious function. The psyche has a religious function. So it's drawn towards uh, religion and spirituality. Um, I think that became one of the, one of the uh, components of individuation too, that it, that it was a relationship to spirituality, included a relationship to, to spirituality. Um, and um, that, um, that his whole, uh, if you look at his whole, um, uh, conceptualization of the psyche that it is moving towards wholeness uh, but that the and that there's something guiding that that he called the self and that the self is a part of the whole uh, the the uh, unus mundus as he borrowed the Latin term from from alchemy uh, is that we came from part we came from a whole and our we, we live this life and then we go back to the whole, but we're always part of that whole. So uh, I think Jung experienced the, the world and life as very, very hopeful. I think he's very hopeful. Now he's had critics around that, that, that his theories uh, ignored or didn't quite address the, um, the experience that patients have around hopelessness. Uh, and one of the struggles I think clinicians have is not, is, is, is not to bring their agenda of hope to a patient. Uh, that the, the patient is, um, it, 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 that is coming to the relationship with hopelessness and powerlessness 
uh, needs the clinician to be able to uh, understand that and not so, try to uh, not try to push an agenda. So are that. you saying that then, you know, I can imagine that many people turn to analysis because they're at a point in their lives where it does seem hopeless. Mm-hmm. And so it, are you saying then that each and every one of us is on their own journey toward hope? It's not somebody else's agenda or it's not a quick fix. It's a journey toward hope. It is. Yeah, it is. Absolutely. Uh, especially people that are coming from such a place, such a dark place of hopelessness. Um, so I wonder also, you know, we, I was fascinated by your idea of reclaiming mm. parts of ourselves. And it led me to want to ask you about the collective unconscious mm. in that, you know, Jung believed that there was, we have individual psyches and then there's a, a collective where all of this, all of this material lives on a societal level. Yes. And I, I think about this week, we're on the verge of a new presidential inauguration. And many of us have watched by now the footage of the US Capitol building under siege by other Americans. And I'm curious to know your thoughts on what might be going on in the collective unconscious. What does this say? Mm. Yes, I think... Um... One of, one, one of the things that is going on is that this um, mass um, thinking, uh, this adoption of a, uh, a, a, a truth that whatever, whatever side you're on, whatever uh, political persuasion, whatever ideology, that, that the temptation, and Jung, Jung was always suspicious of groups um, and, and mass movements because he felt the, that we can be taken over by uh, uh, demigods. We can be um, um, illusioned uh, with, with a truth that's, that's very tempting to take on and then marshal all our uh, energies in that direction um, to believe something that on a mass scale, because uh, it's um, it's easier. Uh, in other words, indiv- another way of looking at individuation, it's a movement out of the collective consciousness uh, and to begin thinking on your own. And the way that Jung describes we do that is to, uh, is to have a relationship to the collective unconscious, which was reflected in all of history, all of mythology, all of uh, literature, uh, and all because all of that reflects uh, the the objective psyche, as he called it. And if we have a relationship to that and realize that we are we are playing out a drama at any aspect of any time in our life, we are playing out a drama. Uh, that if we understand what is unconsciously affecting us in that trauma and that is, is driving us. And when we become conscious of that, we're no longer uh, uh, victimized by it. We're no longer uh, a, a, a pawn or a puppet. And I think many people today, um, ironically, because you know, we're, you know, um, we have all the available uh, knowledge after Jung analytical psychology and psychoanalysis to break free of the collective uh, attitudes. But yet uh, I think mo- most people fall into this habit of taking on one, an ideology because they have, because it's, it's easier. You know, you're saying individuation is painful. Well, it's painful to break free of the collective it's much more comforting to hold on to collective uh, thoughts or ideas or, or um, my- mythology uh, that, that develops, um, or I won't use the word mythology, it's almost uh, stories 
that seem to, now we have this mass communication with uh, social media and such, uh, it's much easier to glob onto that, uh, to attach our identities to something larger, what we see as larger, rather than, you know, like Jung, hold on to the light in his dream, hold on to that light uh, and, and build that light and, and grow that light against the, the blackness that's uh, of the shadows. Um, I, I think that's what I'm finding. And the greatest work that we can do in this particular time is the work of individuation, studying and studying and, and, and you know, uh, and analysis and therapy and, and uh, trying to understand what is going on inside of us, so trying to understand our nature. And our nature includes more than uh, just what's immediately in front of us. Our nature includes this uh, archaic uh, connection to our humanity uh, that goes all the way back to the, to the birth of man. So you talked about wanting people to understand now in this age of social media and groupthink, um, kind of using in, wanting institutions to stand for some of the work that we have to just do as individuals. Institutions yes. can't do that work for us. Yes. And so it makes me wonder, as you were developing this course, mm. which is a sweeping look at you know Jung's life and his yes. his theories, what was your driving motivation to do this? It's a good question. Um, I think I've always taught, um, and because I like a relationship to to um, to groups, and and over many years I've re, um, I've gotten past the, the, the terror of going in front of people and talking, but I've also realized the opportunities in that is, is to learn a great deal. Um, because we're, it's, it's a forum that's, that's designed to provide a containment for, for people so that they can fee, think and feel uh, what they want. So it's a safe place. Um, but also it's an intimate place where people can really talk about what they're thinking, what their fears are. Um, and in, for our course, it's, it's an attraction to Jung. And that the, the course is really designed as a mentorship uh, to provide a safe place for people to continue their development of uh, an understanding of Jung and his works. And uh, to provide a structure for that. Um, and I think ultimately, since we tied it to Memories, Dreams, and Reflections, his uh, semi-autobiographical work, uh, we're tying it to his life. So it's not just his concepts that we're explaining. It's in, in his own words, because many of his, his own essays, his works is being used for reading, but also tied it to his life and what was going on in his life at the very stages, um, because we designed the course as uh, into stages of early, middle and late years. And so we wanted to show, this is what was going on with Jung at this time, because we certainly have uh, a very intimate details of his life that he provided us. Um, Memories, dreams, reflection is very intimate. And he didn't even want it published in his lifetime. It was, it was so intimate, such an intimate reflection uh, of his life. Well, I, I can't help but ask, as you lay out the three sections, beginning, middle, and end of his life, and because you've got this rare insight uh, as a trained Jungian into end of life and how people face the end of life, how does that inform the way you look at the end of Jung's life? What was going on for him? And what lessons could we draw from that? Um, wow. Yeah. I, it what strikes me about uh, what I know of the end of Jung's life was, and this is, this is something that um, 
I experienced working with with dying patients. There was there was just certain experiences that that was not explainable in medicine and medical uh, curricular or hospice curricular. Uh, and uh, and uh, the example is that somebody could be in a kind of a, uh, a um, sedative state um, for long periods of time. Uh, as, as our body starts to shut down, we go through lo long periods of sleeping, for example. And, uh, and sometimes the, they could go on for days. Uh, and then the, you know, the, the body starts to dry up, meaning you know, the less, they take in less and less water, less and less food. And this body's going through this state where there are more someplace else than they are here, wherever they're at, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then all of a sudden, and this is ubiquitous, it's, it's not all the time, but it's so often that hospice staff talk about it, um, that a person will suddenly wake up. Uh, they'll be very lucid. They'll, they'll give instructions. Uh, they'll do certain things. They'll say certain things. And then all of a sudden, shortly after that, um, they go back into their um, um, sleep, their sleep, and then they shortly die after that. There's this period of um, oh, finishing. I call it finishing. Uh, that wherever they were, they come back for this last thing. Now, Jung did that. Jung was in a, uh, a, a state of sleep for for days uh, before uh, the end of his life. And the day he died, uh, he suddenly uh, woke up, uh, asked his son to go down to the cellar to get a bottle of wine and that they were going to have a last meal together uh, with a glass of wine. Um, and they did that. And it was that evening that Jung died. So interesting. I, as you talk about this, it makes me want to ask you, how were you drawn to Carl Jung and his work? Mm. I, th I think for me, it was, a, it was a, a point in my life when I was desperate. Um, and I think desperation becomes very, very important for us uh, to reach a state of desperation in which we're, we have to reach out to undeveloped parts of our personality. Um, and that happened to me when I was about 49 and my life became, um, um, meaningless. Although I was working with in hospice, I, I had a job, I had a family, I had wonderful things in my life, but I couldn't appreciate any of it. All of it, every, my life was a wasteland. Um, and then several things started to break through for me. Um, I was listening to, to uh, uh, a song by Bob Dylan, by Bob Dylan singing Mr. Tambourine Man. And I just broke down because I suddenly realized what he was singing about. And I had heard that song a million times and didn't understand, didn't understand it until that moment. <laughs> um, but I was getting more experiences like that where I would just, it, something would hit me and it would, break through this malaise that I was in. And um, I, end up, I end up reading a, um, a end of life book by James Hillman called The uh, Force of Character. And that was all about end of life. That was about aging. That was about, that was about everything I was working with at that time, only from a very Jungian perspective. And I said, this makes sense to me. And it sparked something in me that I think I would call what Jung called the religious function, uh, this, this movement towards meaning and purpose. And, and so from Hillman, I went to Jung and, um, and by, you know, found out that, the, that there was a training program at the Jung Institute in Chicago back in the early 2000s, uh, started by Gus Swick and Jane Camerling. And I got accepted into that, and I did that pro that two year program. And then I needed more, and uh, and I became a nurse psychiatric nurse practitioner. That took three years. And after that, I 
uh, was accepted into the analyst training program. And then I did that. So this journey has been going on for like a long time. <laughs> well, that is, uh, first of all, it's an inspiring story mm. that, you know, you broke through all malaise. And I think that that's probably resonant for a lot of people right now. Mm. You know, we live in a, in a time of uncertainty. Mm. And so, I'm going to ask you another hard question. I realize I've been asking you a lot of big questions. They're good questions. Thank you. Uh, I I wonder <clears throat> how, how if what would be the one thing if if somebody wanted to feel like they could break through the fog of uncertainty right now that we're living in with the pandemic and. Um, an economy that's rocking and, you know, pe people are losing their work identities and their, their sense of place and a sense of purpose. What's the one Jungian ideal that they could hang on to that would help them? Mm. I'm asking for it like a, a, I guess a, it's a simple question, really. Maybe it's oversimplified, but what would be the the life ring that you would throw them? Well, um, I, I think, you know, the, the most important thing, which you can't really tell somebody in that state, so you have to be with them in the state that they're in. Um, that is really the pathway to the darkest places within us. Um, and for to to for a therapist to be of any help to a patient, but I, I, if I think conceptually, <laughs> to answer the question, I think we have to move from um, uh, the our experience of life as victims, being victimized by life, which is very tempting for all of us, right? Particularly at this time when things are taken away from us and we're isolated. And it's very tempting to, to feel victimized. Um, uh, to move to a place in one's life of authorship that we're really and can be an author of our life, uh, which sounds very um, uh, inflated, very paradoxical that somebody would, would experience, would, would, be the author of this misery, right? <laughs> um, but that we, the, there was no guarantees that we would come into the world and 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 ha have everything given to us. There's there's and that the darker uh, and austere aspects of life can be just as valuable uh, as the rest of it, and 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 is necessary, is necessary. Um, and again. Telling somebody that when they're in the midst of it is not helpful, <laughs> but right. uh, help s sitting with them while they're in it, it, it can probably be the most helpful thing that we could do. Thank you, Dan. That's a great place to end today. And this has been just marvelous to talk Thank with you. you. Thank you. This has been a wonderful opportunity. And I appreciate you doing this. Oh, my pleasure. Believe me. podcast is distributed under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. Share it all you like as long as you maintain the attribution to the speaker, but please do not change it or sell it. If you like this episode, tell your friends about us or leave us a review on iTunes. For more information about classes, training programs, videos, audio, this podcast, or to find a Jungian analyst near you, visit our website, www.youngchicago.org. Thank you to the 2020 donors who gave at the supporting member level and above. Barbara Anand, Usha and Ashok Beatty, Jackie K. Bryan, Eric Cooper, Judith Cooper, Kevin Davis, George J. Didier, James Fidelibus, John Koroluski, Marty Manning, Diane Sherwood, Deborah P. Stutzman, Deborah Tobin, Alexander Wayne and Lynn Kopp, Gerald Weiner, Karen West, and James Taylor, and Ellen Young. 
and thank you to everybody else who gave at that level but wishes to remain anonymous.